Sadu, sadu, sadu. So I welcome all of you. And I had my experience with time today. <laughs> when you're a nun, sometimes, you know, we don't know what day it is. We just keep working. <laughs> and I worked and worked and I thought today was Tuesday. And I was going along today thinking how I was going to give you a support page and everything for tomorrow. <laughs> this is, and he called me up and told me, here we are. <laughs> and I have everything here, except I didn't type your support page. So um, I was working for like two days on this website, trying to help it get a little bit uh, more organized. So eventually we will have a website here in Asia where we will be able, I will be able anyway, and I hope that any teachers that I help to train will be able to go to, to get support pages for you on a lot of different subjects. And um, we will be hooked into the Damasuka site for the main library, but we're going to put uh, on our library, we're going to put uh, a couple of, um, we're going to collect retreats that are in you know, the Hindi and in the Marathi, if we have those translations, sometimes a whole retreat and put retreats on there that you can make sure if they're in English, you can make the uh, slow them down. If you don't know already, I will tell you that on YouTube, there is the little wheel and when you're listening to a talk, there's a little wheel on the bottom, on the right side of the uh, page, and it's the settings wheel. And if you click on that, most of the time, you can, uh, if you click it for me, if I was really excited about the Dhamma, <laughs> Then you click it on 75 and it will be perfect for you to listen to. I'm telling you ahead of time. Because uh, you see, Bhante was grew up on the West Coast of the United States. Everybody's kind of laid back. And, you know, they speak a lot slower. I was born in the Northeastern United States. <laughs> And we really do talk fast like this sometimes. And I am trying to get slower. But if I'm not slow, I want you to write me a note. It's important to me that I keep trying to get slowed down. Tonight, what we're going to do um, is we are going to go to the Samyutta Nikaya a little bit. And we're going to look at what's called the 10 powers. And there are two suttas in here. And then what I'm going to do is um, send you a support page so that you can follow on the Upanisa Sutta because we're going to go through the Upanisa Sutta. And we, we should be able to do all of this together, uh, probably in the span of about an hour because these two are very short, but they're very important, okay? First of all, let me go off here for just a minute and get the support page for the Upanisa Sutta. And I'm going to send that through Dhammagavesi to send it so that you can get it. All right, just one second. Uh, let's see if I can do this the right way, okay. Oh, well, I can do it sometimes. I'll be right back. Okay.
She's there. That lady lives She's inside talking. my computer. I think you all have one of these AI ladies that live in your computer now. <laughs> They're tricky. Okay, so here we go. We're going to talk about the 10 powers. And this is in the, in the Samyutta Nikaya. It's on page 552. If you have this book, this is Bhikkhu Bodhi translation. Now, the 10 powers, this was at Sawati, uh, because possessing the 10 powers and the four grounds of self-confidence, the Tathagata claims the place of the chief bull of the herd and roars his lion's roar in the assemblies and sets rolling the Brahma wheel thus. In this way, such is form, such its origin, such its passing away, such is feeling, such its origin, such its passing away, such is perception, such its origin, such its passing away, such are formations, such their origin, such their passing away. Such is consciousness, such its origin, such its passing away. And thus, when this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. And with the cessation of this, that ceases. Now, what he's then what he does is he goes through all the pieces of dependent origination. This is in the Nidana Vaga, the Nidana Samyutta. So it's in the section of the Samyutta dedicated to teaching you the dependent origination. Now, the, the reason I'm doing this is to get to the simplest point, what was the Buddha actually doing when he was teaching? What was he attempting to do? And He's teaching a series of different ways. He has about three or four ways of doing this. And he's trying to get you to step away from the conventional reality you live in. He is trying to get you to step back and look at everything impersonally. He is trying to let you help you to let go of Atta. Atta is the identification with everything. Atta and anatta, it needs a lesson of its own. <laughs> and what I think happened with this whole thing, it appears to me that the students get very confused and many people are very almost afraid to come to Buddhism and face the idea of even examining a self and the idea of no self. So what uh, it seemed to me that very firmly in understanding this, that the problem for people is that's very frightening, but let's look at it a different way. And every generation you must understand about Buddhism, it's not locked in like some of the Hinduism is locked in and you memorize and recite and don't question. Buddha was telling everyone to question all the time, not to believe the person who is teaching you there. They should only be helping. His idea was they should only be guiding you to examine this. So every generation that comes along in Buddhism since the Buddha is gone is responsible to smoke out the sheds. This is in 33, Sutta number 33 in Majima Nikaya. What does it mean, smoke out the sheds? Well, <laughs> it can get very messy when someone teaches something so simple and then he leaves and he's not there to clarify again and again what it meant. And so quickly, human beings will turn it into their own, say it in their own words, and whispering down the lane, we all know it doesn't come out the same way at the end that it was in the beginning. So it's simple to understand that things got lost very easily. 
and they got mixed up with different parts because there were so many parts in the puzzle. So we look, we should, smoking out the sheds means for the farmer, if he has a shed that he puts his grain in or his crop before he stores it, each time he does a harvest, he must smoke it out to disinfect it and make sure it is safe for the, the harvest to go into the shed to keep it and then to turn it into the flower or whatever. It has to be a safe place to put the harvest. It means going back to the pure, pure, pure form. It's a cleansing process, okay? And so when you look at this, um, the Buddha was trying to talk about self and no self with Atta or Anatta. He's saying your problem is that you think everything that is happening in your life, it is me, it is mine, it is myself. It is even to the extent in some suttas it says, this is who I am. So this I idea is very personal, very, very personal. And so when you look around during COVID, you see everybody is kind of snappy and some not getting along in living situations, having a tough time being cut off. I was talking today to a young man and his age group, he's like 17. They've been cut off from high school. 13 to 18 has got to be really serious for COVID because when you're cut off from your development in school, it's really hard on you, you know? And then the other group that is very hard for is the very elderly because they had personal contact with people. And when they lose that, they've slipped back into the past. And if the past was perfect, that's not so bad. But if the past was not, you know, or the memories are upsetting. It's so easy if you don't have contact with people and you think about people living alone. If you know anybody living alone, even if you can reach out and give them an apple once a week and say, hello, you know, it's a good thing because people are so cut off right now. With that, this whole thing has taken away our personal contact. And they need, we need this in the elderly years, but also in the teenage years. This is very important to develop. So anyway, this I, me, my mind problem, the Buddha was telling the monks in Chachaka Sutta, Majima Nikaya number 148, he was telling them, you know, the problem for your suffering is you take things personally. And then what do you mean? And then he explains to them using the sense stores, just the six sense stores. Now, this, this one is using the five aggregates. Uh, but when they took the sense stores in, uh, in the uh, Chachaka Sutta, so the, the Sutta is only six pages long <laughs> until you type it out completely. And then it's 36 pages or 29 pages long because everything in that Sutta, every section is done six times for six separate sense stores. And they want you, we want you, we, we write the whole thing out because we want you to experience it as you're reading it or as you're examining it, not just have ditto marks in there. That's not good because this was a, a pre, this was an exercise to get you to really understand what does it mean? So first he says to the monks in Chichaka, he says, you know, if anyone sells, tells you the I is self, it's not acceptable because the rise and fall of the I seeing is seen and understood. And since it is discerned, then my, you think myself arises and passes away my, it, the same way. But that's not the case, is it? Because when the eye sees something and then it's over and it starts to see something else, you are still there. So then he, once he explains this to them, they, they, they sort of probably sat there and frowned a little bit and said, how did that happen? Then he goes through the whole thing and he said, this happened to you because when you grew up, you were seeing people say, this is me, this is mine, this is myself. 
and then they say to him after he presents all six of the sense doors again, then they're sitting there. So how do we get out of this? And he knows what they're thinking. And he says, now let me show you how you get out of it. When you go out tomorrow, he doesn't say this, but we know it means this. Tomorrow, when you go after alms and you go out to sit in the forest or wherever you're sitting, you need to watch this very, very closely because you need to unpractice saying to the brain, you see, oh, now we're talking about he's teaching you to communicate with your brain. This is a wonderful thing. He's finally, after all these years you're learning, you can communicate with your brain, teach it what the intention should be, and then stay in the wholesome side of things. And you will begin to change your behavior. You will begin to be happier staying, consciously staying, in what? In the impersonal side of things. So when we look at this, he says to them, the way you get out of this is tomorrow when you go out, you can do this yourself all day long. I did it, I walked around in the forest, but I walked around when I was driving in town and shopping and everything. And I watched myself with a seeing and hearing and speaking and everything, you know, and how I felt. And I said, what if I practice all day long? But this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. So he's teaching them to practice letting go and taking life more impersonally. So, so how, how do we think we know this? How do we think we know this? Well, in the translations, if we examine the translations closely, we see that Bhikkhu Bodhi, we call Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation the working translation. You see newer translations coming, but they're not as workable. They don't hook all together with all the suttas. But Bhikkhu Bodhi's is special because it's consistent. Nanamoli and him work together, the venerable Nanamoli, and then they finish this uh, Majima Nikaya and Samyutta Nikaya, the same ties in with it and it agrees as supporting everything. See? So when you're practicing, uh, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself, you're saying whatever is happening, it has a beginning, it's rising up, it's happening, and it's passing away. Oh, you're experiencing a Nietzsche every time you let go see something that is pulling you away with twim the practice you're saying oh i recognize that but uh i'm going to let go relax smile and come back and leave it alone why because you know anicca is real so if you understand anicca you say well i i understand anicca but do you really understand internally, Anicca, in your heart and mind completely, you would just let things pass away. Nothing would bother you at all. This is how equanimity starts to develop. Nothing bothers you anymore. Why? Well, because you understand more deeply Anicca, the Dukkha, and the Anatta. The Anatta is setting you free. It's the escape. Anatta. So how did we get to this uh, translation? Explain how he do is okay. We say uh, self, no self, no deal. You can't understand it. <laughs> you get very frustrated, very angry. You go see Parel, you say, wait a minute, self, no self. I'm here. I don't want to give myself up. Especially if you are a young person you do not want to give yourself up. You know, you want a personality and friends. You don't want to, to do that. So we looked in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation around what is there. What did we see? We saw identification, non-identification in, in 43 and 44, those two suttas in, in uh, Majima Nikaya, you find identification, non-identification. And, and it's okay, you get the idea. But then we saw personality and non-personality. Oh, what is the root word for personality? Personal. And then that gave Bhante the idea that we can fix this whole thing. 
and he taught us that you know if this is really not about self and no self it's the consequence of believing everything is about the self if it is then you are responsible it's your fault you're to blame for everything oh, oh dear this is terrible i'm thinking that's exactly how i felt when i was growing up i thought everything was on top of me everything was happening everything was pressing me down and it was going to suffocate me because it was all my fault uh-oh very very heavy but what if we looked at it a different way. If we knew about a Nietzsche, we knew everything happening was coming up, was going to be there, was passing away. Okay, that's a great thing. Then if I'm patient, it's going to pass away anyway. Isn't this new? Yeah, it's new. Maybe it's not my fault completely. You see, I'm not a victim. Everything is not on me. Maybe if I look at the world a little bit differently, maybe I will feel better. And so that's what he did to the monks. He said, go out there. And he said, walk around. If you hear a sound before you get upset, remember it's a, just a sound. It's not my sound. It's just the ear and the sound and the ear consciousness working in the body. It's coming, it's there, it's leaving. You're still here. So obviously it is not you. That's Chachaka Sutta in action as a drill, you're practicing it. That's what that is. Now, this one is talking about even a more basic thing about this whole thing. He says, you know, look, such a form. Uh, he says, you need to understand such is form. This is what this form is that you see. And how does it happen? It happens because the eye sees this form. And how does it pass away? It passes away because of a Nietzsche. Okay. Okay. So a feeling. I had a car accident and boy, was I hurting. Okay. But the cause of my hurting was a car accident. It's legitimate. So why should I get really upset about the whole thing? I don't need to. I really don't. So you say feeling such as a feeling such its origin such as passing away he's just telling them relax this is part of life everything arises it's there it passes away you see it's like music it's like this is a tune it's like in everybody everybody universally around the world then he's saying, you know, how this is working. He's also telling you something. I'm not really teaching you dependent origination right now tonight. So, um, you know, uh, what he's trying to tell you is it's operating the same way as dependent origination operates, where, you know, with one thing coming up, then this other thing can be born. Now, this thing that's born from this first thing it's not any part of the first thing in that but you had to have this before you could have that great thing have to have air in the tire of the bike before you can ride it yeah it's a simple you can use it all through life whatever arises had something as a cause for it to happen then it happens then it's there then it leaves now we have four pieces there's three pieces here, but I'm giving you four. So it wasn't there, it comes up, it is there during that time, then it passes away. So if you look at Anupada Sutta, the 111 is telling you that condition is occurring. Sariputta was able to watch that in his meditation. In his meditation, he was able to watch it each time it was happening. He kept saying the same line. I understood and I, he said, I watched them. The, the sutta means one by one as they occur. It, that is what the sutta is about, watching that happen. And that's what's exciting about this practice. We can see it, we can watch it. We just have to be very quiet, move back, don't speak <laughs> and just watch it. And you see it. Then it comes, arises, but then it's there, then it leaves. 
just don't have any personal opinion about it. Don't judge it. Don't examine it. Don't, please don't move over to the hindrance. Ever move over to the hindrance. Why? Mm. <laughs> because you personally feed the hindrance your attention and I guarantee that hindrance will come back tomorrow and the next day and the next day in your practice and be messy for you. And you won't be able to sit long and clear and see clearly. But if you listen to what the Buddha teaches about this hindrance problem or obstruction or uh, disturbance or distraction or whatever you want to call it, the imperfection of the mind, when you understand that you are feeding it. You are nobody else. And if you stop feeding it and just go on with your object of meditation, loving kindness to the spiritual friend, then to the other people, then to the directions, then you're doing Corona, it turns into compassion. You just watch this happening. We are showing you how the Buddha was teaching this like a butterfly. Yeah, it's the four pieces of the butterfly. The larva becomes the worm and the worm just has one job, eat, 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 <laughs> okay, the leaves. Then it's strong enough, he build the chrysalis in the cocoon. Then it climbs in the cocoon and sits there. Then it comes out as a butterfly. <laughs> is a butterfly yeah you wouldn't interrupt a butterfly would you you're not supposed to if your grandmother gives you the big worm because she finds a beautiful big worm for the moth you can put it in the big jar and you have to make sure there's water in there and you have to make sure the leaves are put in for the worm to eat and he'll build the chrysalis if you put the stick in there and at the end of this of june or early part of july he'll come out and if you see him come out you got to get him out the window let him fly away you see my grandmother used to do that with us every year we could see the swallowtail moth get born because she knew where the uh the caterpillars when they came and we went down to the seashore june july like that and it happened in those months so anyway he's just giving you a simple message here you know and his one thing about the uh if you're working with the poly if you're coming from the university some of you are coming from the university you should check this for me this is important you have five aggregates body feeling perception, thought, and consciousness. And in the text, in the translations, some most of the time, we find out the aggregates affected by clinging. That's how it is phrased, of the aggregates affected by clinging. But what it really means, we know what it really means, the aggregates if affected by clinging, aha, or the aggregates when affected by clinging, but they never put in if it's affected or when it's affected. When they write the suttas, somehow the translator always says those aggregates affected by clinging. And then over time, because they didn't put if you take it personally, then it becomes clinging, you see? Or when you decide, I don't like it or I like it and get involved with this, these pieces, okay? That is when the clinging is a problem, it happens. Clinging cannot happen unless I am there, you see? So if I stay away from it, so I would be interested for you to look in some of the suttas you look at and see where it's talking about the aggregates. What does it say? Because uh, when we are studying this and teaching you and always teaching you from the practice perspective, does it operate in the meditation so that I can see it? Am I doing that? And I... Am I stopping from getting a hold of it and getting uptight in life? If that's happening, then you are not taking it personally and you are reducing the clinging. See? 
Now, you know, on this line of development in the suttas, that the craving is I like it or I don't like it mind. And then those two translate again, because you say, if I say it's a painful feeling and then craving starts, I don't like it mine means what? I don't want this. And then it means, uh, that means aversion. And then the aversion flips over and I get attached to trying to want to make it stop. So it's tricky, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't understand that. It was like, um, I don't have a coin here, but we can use this, you know, this top, you know, as two sides. So here, here is, um, you know, uh, here is the, um, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, I like it and I want it and attachment that's where that goes <laughs> if you don't stop if you don't let go and do your six hours it goes immediately i don't like this it's painful i don't like it and i i i want this to stop oh well, i'm sorry i did it i i it's a pleasant feeling i like it i want it and now I'm attached to it and I'm going to think about it all day long and I can't work because I can't stop thinking about this. I want this. See? So then the aversion is I painful feeling pops up somehow. See, hear, smell, taste, touch, five choices. Even thinking if you're resting but you're worrying, then you have a problem. Okay. And the painful feeling comes up. I don't like this, right? I don't like this. I don't want it, aversion. So this attachment aversion is happening all the time. This was the base of the suffering. This was the heart of the craving. And it all comes back to I or, hey, wait a minute. This is just happening. I opened my eye. I didn't make it see. And I, it started to see, but it's not my fault. Okay, and the ear and the nose and the mouth and the feeling, see? So try it for a few days and see if you can live impersonally with an impersonal perspective. Perspective turns out if you have an impersonal perspective, that turns into right view. And anything that you write about right view, the uh, samadhiti, okay, is always going to work right if you are impersonal about everything and you see things only as they are happening okay let's see what is it let's see okay we got time so now we look at the 10 powers in the next sutta he says listen to this one possessing the 10 powers and the four grounds of self-confidence this tathagata and claims the place of the bull and the herd of the herd and the roaring lion at the assemblies and sets rolling the Brahma wheel. And then it goes through the whole thing about body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness again. Then it says, such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. If you, if you let it go, if you just see it as it's happening and take it in personally, that is how it, it ends. That is how it stops, okay? And you, you, um, you take it in personally and you see the dependent origination happening as an a impersonal process that is working through the body and mind, just impersonal, it's there. Then the Dhamma has thus been well expounded by me, elucidated, disclosed, revealed, and this is interesting, stripped of its patchwork. That's what I feel about tranquil wisdom insight meditation we stripped it down to just the bare pieces and give you the simple instructions and that's it and that's what the buddha was doing with his monks that's why they were making so much progress that's why they were making sotapanna sotapanna fruition sakagami sakagami fruition anagami anagami and fruition and going sometimes as far as arahat 
oh, do I have to go to Arahat? Wait a second, wait a second. I am married. What if I'm married? I'm going to get your talk about this in a minute. Hmm. Tell me what I should do. I'm married. I don't know want to do that. Well, it's like this, okay? Um, if you're practicing the, the, the development and you're going for the attainments, they'll come very naturally. They're not something you try to get. They're something that evolve in the progress. But you don't have to go uh, as far as Arahat in this life. You can set yourself up working through the Brahma Viharas. This is what is very comfortable about this. And when you pass into the next life, you go to Brahmaloka. In Brahmaloka as Anagami, you cannot come back in this body again, born through a womb of a woman. You cannot. So now you're in Brahmaloka, okay? And you're not coming back here again to do this, all right? And you've solved that and you're going to become Arahat in Brahmaloka and finish in Brahmaloka. That's not bad, not bad at all. <laughs> not a bad setup at all. So the problem for the person who goes as far as out of heart in this, in this life, in the marriage and family, it gets a little difficult with this with the uh, anagami because the the passion gets less and less and less because you you you're not so needy anymore. You have a good relationship with the person, but you're not really into a lot of passion and stuff the way that you were before. But does it take away the enjoyment of something like uh, music or art or playing an instrument or painting? No, it changes it. Yeah, it changes it. And I see these painters go from ruddy orange and dirty brown and black and gray and come out with sea greens and blues and beautiful sunsets and golden sunlight. What happened to his art? It's changed because that was all the bad feeling inside and lots of craving and lots of dislike for the world and everything now he's at ease now he's let go of personal and he can live with himself and his art and what about the person playing the cello should they stop cello playing and become a good buddhist why if they have the skill for the flute or skill for the music they should play i tell you i'm a, a musician and have been a singer for all my life but the thing is, a nun, we don't go around singing, but I do teach you in Sunday school by singing the parts so you remember them. <laughs> and that's sort of not cheating, really. It's, if you remember the parts, you'll see things much quicker. But I don't go and sing a lot of music. But if I listen to something that is classical now, if I listen to something when I'm driving long distance, I can hear every single note mathematically put together. I could never do that before, not ever. So this is the focal difference in the brain. There's no pressure on anything and there's focal difference. And when you focus, you can do much more precise drawing. The other thing that happened to me was I could not draw with depth at all with any kind of depth that looked accurate. Now I can draw uh, you know, a room with furniture sitting in it, antiques in a, sitting in it, or a, an old ornate sort of rugs and things hanging on the wall, and actually make you see a room. I've had no ability to do that before. How did it happen? Because this is not tortured anymore. <laughs> it's not tortured, you see? Because it's clear, I know the secret about living life, and it's not a secret. The Buddha told you what it was. If you be Bhadarakata Sutta, the one, it's one, what is it? 131, 132, 133, and 134. Because the four suttas saying the same thing. Do not get stuck in the past in your mind. Do not get stuck in the future in your mind. Future is not here and the past is gone. Stay in the present time. Don't try to stay in the present moment because if you do, you're going to get a headache. <laughs> okay, but you can stay in the present time of what you're doing one thing at a time. Now, I just last week took two people and put them on a different schedule of living 
and one of them is doing really good now with time to work on their studies where they didn't have it before because we talked about what is what is what is um essential and what is unessential the past is unessential for you in the present time and the future is unessential for you only the present time so if you're carrying a backpack on your back and it's full of all the stuff in the past and it's getting heavy and you have a front pack your mother thought you needed one of those too to worry about the future i suggest one thing for you when you leave the house take this one off and hang it on a hook and take this one off and hang it on a hook and then walk out the door and go to school. When you come back, if you really have to put them on, you can put them on again, but I suggest you hang them on the hook more and more because you can't do anything about what's in the bag. You can't do anything about what's in the bag about the past and you can't do anything about the bag in front of you about the future because you don't know what it is going to be so we get common sense again this is the buddhist common sense come back to the present time he gives you the present time and he tells you how do we handle this when we have all these things coming up in our head he says you practice right effort what is right effort recognize you have an unwholesome tightness and tension in your head that unwholesome mind state is like that let go of that and relax is the second step and that's when you relax your head just oh let the air out you were holding this like this and you let go oh, there you go you relax see somebody said what is you're putting breathing in that i'm not putting breathing in there if you grab a hold, if I, you throw this to me and I grab a hold of it, I'm holding my breath when I caught it, especially if it was a glass that was going to hit the floor and hurt the kids. I caught it. <laughs> now I'm holding it. <sighs> there, that's what I'm talking about. So you let go of the obstacle in your mind. You relax and smile and come back. Relax, smile, come back is like for relax, smile, come back. Rela three little steps, like relax, smile, come back. And if you want to, you can play my game. And my game is very simple. Never mind, you know, never mind this. I just never mind, relax, smile, come back. <laughs> you say, never mind. When you say never mind, you let it go. You relax your head, smile and come back. That's the way it is. And you, when you're recognizing it, you, you, know, you recognize it. And the moment you recognize this tension, that's when you go, never mind. And you have expressions. Uh, you can tell me when, you, when we get break here a minute. OK, you have expressions. Every language has expressions. I mean, let it be. You let it be. Relax, smile, come back. That's all we're showing you. And that's all the Buddha taught in right effort. Right effort didn't mean work hard, persevere, don't give up, keep going, put your shoulder into the whole thing and drop dead from not eating and don't forget, don't sleep. He never told you to suffer. He told you that the most exciting and the not exciting, but the most excellent meditation was a comfortable meditation that was pleasant and you had clear understanding of the Dhamma. That's his definition in, in Sutta number 28, section, I think it's section 10, Sutta number 28 in the Digha Nikaya, the modes of progress. You can look it up for yourself. Three, three, three different ways, it's poor meditation. Only one way is excellent meditation. Pleasant meditation with clear, quick, clear comprehension of the Dhamma. So he was teaching two things at one time, right? He was teaching you how to be sure you totally understand this Dhamma. And then he was teaching you how to do the meditation so you couldn't be interrupted. Well, that's impossible, sister. I've, I've been sitting for how long? And I can sit for 40 minutes. I'm only one minute on the person during that maybe an hour when I sit. One minute? 
that means you were one minute off, one minute on, one minute off, one minute on for 60 minutes. That's not relaxing. I'm exhausted. I bet you are exhausted. You're not supposed to be doing anything. And if anything comes up, you're supposed to remember it doesn't have anything for you. It doesn't have any information. And whatever it is, it arose by itself and it's going to pass away by itself. So leave it alone. Who says so? Alagadupa Masuda, Majima Nikaya number 21, section six. <laughs> I sound like an old Bible thumper. <laughs> you know, I really do. Okay. But if you go to the Alagadupa Masuda, it's really clear. Arati, the monk Arati, Venerable Arati had a problem. He wanted to say, it's okay for me to go over there and look at what came up. It's okay for me to do that. And the Buddha came and said, ah, 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 don't do that. He said, how many times have you heard me tell you that if an obstacle comes up, the only way the obstacle can become an obstruction, that's a hindrance or a distraction or a disturbance. The way it becomes an obstruction to stop your meditation is if you engage it. Engaging something means you get involved with it. You move away from your spiritual friend. If you're sending me meta, keep doing it because I need to build this website. <laughs> so keep sending it if you are sending it to me. But if you stop because of something you're thinking about, I'll never get the website. <laughs> so maybe you should do that that way. You know, maybe you should try that. All right, let's go. What, what is it? 19, so it's 19 minutes. Okay, we can do this because I'm just going to let you listen to this one. And then I'm going to send you the paper because when I went in the file, I had four choices and I didn't want to open up the documents to see which one to send you. So when we're finished the talk, I'll send you a copy of the sutta and you can see for yourself how this works. This sutta is proximate cause. It's on 553 in Samyutta Nikaya. It's also called Upanisa Sutta. It also appears again in Anguttara Nikaya. It must have been important. They said it twice. Okay, so here we go. He say at Salati, Bhikkhus, I say that the destruction of the taints is for one who knows and sees, not for one who does not know and does not see. For one who knows what, for one who sees what, does the destruction of the taints come about? Such is form, such its origin, such its passing away. It's telling you that's what you're supposed to be watching in your meditation. Such is feeling, such its origin, such its passing away, such is perception, such its origin, such its passing away. Such are formations, such their origin, such their passing away. Such is consciousness, such its origin such it's passing away. It is for one who knows thus, one who sees thus, that the destruction of the taints comes about. Now I say to you monks, that the knowledge of the destruction is in, in regard to the destruction, it has a cause, a proximate cause, and it does not lack a proximate cause. And what is the proximate cause for the knowledge of this destruction. It should be said liberation. Now this is interesting because it starts in one spot and it works through the, um, it works through the, um, you, well, you'll see, but it's working through the 12 links of dependent origination, but it's also showing you the developmental line for the, the development of your mind. It shows you the line of development. So we consider this to be a line of development that it's showing you precisely how you learn the meditation. So listen carefully. What is the proximate cause for the knowledge of the destruction of the 
uh, the taints. It should be said liberation, the vimuti, you see. I, I say, monks, the liberation too has a proximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. And what is the proximate cause for liberation? It should be said, dispassion is the cause for the liberation. You get to the level of dispassion where you are not concerned with anything. And then you're ready to fall into Niroda Samapati. But you have to be gone. I mean, gone. You have to be not involved at all in wanting, dissecting, managing, or making anything happen anymore and just watching this natural process take place, or it won't happen. I say that that dispassion too has a proximate cause, and it does not lack a proximate cause. What is the proximate cause for dispassion? And it should be said disenchantment. Now in the text here, it says revulsion, but that is not the same thing he translated in other suttas that say the same thing. And we took back disenchantment because revulsion is personally hard, you know, to be re reviled of, of something is very personal. And this is not a personal uh, level, disenchantment. So I say, monks, that revulsion too has a proximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. What is the proximate cause for the, re the revulsion? And it is said that the knowledge and vision of things as they really are is the cause. And uh, I say, that the knowledge and vision of things as they really are too has a proximate cause. What is the, what um, is the, it does not lack a proximate cause. What is the proximate cause of knowledge and vision of things as they really are? It should be said concentration and we say collectedness or you can say precisely productive level of concentration. Okay, I say monks that the that concentration has approximate cause it does not lack a cause what is the cause for the concentration, it should be said happiness we're saying sukha here sukha. And then I say that happiness too has a proximate cause what was the proximate cause of the happiness. And it should be said, tranquility is the cause of the happiness. Whenever tr tranquility fades away, you will notice a deep internal contentment and it's a little smile on your face, not full of energy. That is Buddhist happiness, sukha, the tranquility pasadi. Okay, I say that tranquility too has a proximate cause and it does not lack a proximate cause. What is the proximate cause for the tranquility? It should be said joy. Now rapture, the reason we don't use the word rapture is because the Christians are waiting for the rapture and we don't want to use this Christian term in the Buddhist explanation, okay? We're just talking about joy and this is the mudita that we're talking about. I say, monks, that rapture, or I'm sorry, joy, has a proximate cause and it does not lack a proximate cause. What is the proximate cause for the joy? It is said that gladness is the cause of the rising of the joy. And we say it, this is pomoja and we like to say relief because when a beginner comes in and they sit, we can see the relief happening, you see? It's not like, I'm really glad it happened. They come and talk to you that way, but it's relief of, from this vibration that was outside in the city and you come into the temple and you sit down and then it goes, Shh. you've never experienced it before. You've been in the mad, mad, mad max world and all of a sudden it stops. I say that gladness too has a proximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. What is the proximate cause for the gladness? And it should be said faith. And this is the sadha. I say that 
Faith has approximate cause. It does not lack approximate cause. And what is the approximate cause for faith? It should be said that suffering is the cause. Why you would come in and put faith in the Buddha, then maybe he found something when he spent six years trying to figure out how people are in pain, physically or mentally. And then I, the suffering has approximate cause. And what is the cause for that suffering? What is the approximate cause of it? It should be said that birth, birth is the approximate cause. Nothing can happen till you're born in this world. And then I say that birth too has approximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. And what is the proximate cause for this birth? It should be said, now this says existence, but this is talking about the bawa, uh, the uh, bawa. And um, we like to say that the bawa is habitual tendencies for reaction. And the untrained mind, who doesn't know anything about what we've been talking about today, is suffering because they have an untrained mind and their very existence is exhausting to them. But we say that this is the habitual tendencies where you pull out a reaction in life from something that happened to you in the past and you do it again. It's a reaction. Then I say that existence too has approximate cause. It does not lack approximate cause. And what is the proximate cause for this, um, this habitual tendency for reaction? It should be said that clinging is the cause, the upadana. And this is the story about why you don't like something. And I say that clinging is the proximate cause. It does not lack approximate cause. What is the proximate cause for clinging? It should be said craving is the proximate cause for the clinging to come up. I don't like it. And then the clinging goes, why not? And tell me why. It's because blah, 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 why you don't like it. And then I say that clinging to has approximate cause. What is the proximate cause of the clinging? And it should be said the craving is. And the craving is the I don't like it. And then the craving or I like it, we said that earlier. The craving too has approximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. What is the cause of this craving? It is said that to be feeling, but it's not really feeling that is, is causing it, only that feeling comes up after it. I am the one that causes the, um, the pain in the feeling to happen. The I carrying forth starting with the craving. There are suttas that say the I is born in craving, that link. So for feeling should be said contact. For contact, the six sen uh, sense basis, and for the six sense basis, the nama rupa is the cause. And for the nama rupa, consciousness is the cause. And for consciousness, volitional formations. So I say to you monks that volitional formations too have a proximate cause. They do not lack a proximate cause. What is the proximate cause for the volitional formations? It is said that ignorance, ignoring the Four Noble Truths, which is all deeper conversation, ignoring the Four Noble Truths and this dependent origination and the three characteristics is what the ig ignoring is in ignorance, okay? So then the ignorance has a proximate cause. Volitional for with, with ignorance as a proximate cause, volitional formations come to be. With volitional formations as a cause, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as a cause, name and form come to be. With name and form as a proximate cause, the six sense bases come to be. With the six sense bases as proximate cause, contact comes to be. With contact as proximate cause, feeling comes to be. With feeling as proximate cause, craving comes to be. With craving as proximate cause, clinging comes to be. With clinging as proximate cause, um, habitual tendencies for reactions come to be. And with the exist existence of these habitual tendencies, 
as proximate cause, the birth of reaction comes to be. With the birth of reaction, suffering comes to be. With suffering as a cause, faith comes to be. So you're suffering now. You go to the temple and somebody says, I know a guy, I know a man who became a Buddha and he found an answer to suffering. And you say, oh, then I am going to put my faith in the fact that the Buddha found something. That's what I did, okay? And as proximate cause. And then gladness comes up. You're very happy that, you know, you have this relief and you're very happy and the gladness is proximate cause. Joy comes to rise. And when joy comes up, then with proximate cause, then tranquility comes up when the joy fades away. And with tranquility as the proximate cause, when it fades away, happiness is left. If happiness is the proximate cause, the concentration becomes perfectly productive. And with productive concentration is the proximate cause, knowledge and vision of things as they really are come to be. And with the knowledge and vision of how these things really are as a proximate cause, then disenchantment comes to be. And with disenchantment as proximate cause, dispassion, with dispassion, liberation, with liberation, the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. Now listen to how, just close your eyes a minute and listen to how this actually happens. It's not bang. It is a gradual teaching, a gradual practice, and a gradual progress. But listen to this one paragraph, and that's the end. Just as when the rain pours down in thick droplets on the mountain top, the water flows down along the slope, and it fills the cleft and the gullies and the creeks. And these being full, they fill up the pools. And these being full, they fill up the lakes. And these being full, they fill up the streams. And these being full, they fill up the rivers. And these being full, fill up the great ocean. And so too with ignorance as condition, formations arise. And then it goes up all the way through until you get to the total cessation and then then you experience Nibbana, that is the not, and you have the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. It goes up through the whole pattern again. From this point, it goes in the direction of your development up through and then watching dependent origination all the way up until you get to with the liberation as a proximate cause, the knowledge of the destruction of the taints come to see. That's the remainderless fading away and cessation of this whole mass of suffering. There you go. So we didn't exactly pick out the 10 powers, did we? <laughs> but there were 10 powers in uh, on page 553 and what the 10 powers that we started this whole conversation about, it had to do with, um, I found this earlier, let me find it, what it is. It has to do with the, um, the jhanas one by one going through the jhanas all the way down and they become powers as part of the path. And it comes out to being these 10 pieces. That's what this is in the 10 powers. Just a short way to explain it. So anybody have questions? And you can always write me a question, but you can let me know if you have a scary question for this one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I, I uh, uh, this is a very uh, uh, nice uh, sutta, you know, it, uh, and even the last paragraph that you read out uh, is a very nice metaphor uh, for what is really happening. So uh, thank you uh, yeah. uh, for sharing that. Now, my question is about uh, this two last two steps, you know, the disenchantment and dispassion. I've never understood the difference. And is there a difference or it is just a... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there is a difference. Okay. So, uh, what, it's like this. Um, when I talk to my students, usually I'm coaching them. I'm explaining 
that disenchantment is kind of like uh, in the old days when I was growing up, everybody went bowling on Wednesday night or they went to the mall. When the malls opened, everybody went to the mall. They, they had this thing they do once a week. And now you just don't have any interest in doing that anymore. You're disenchanted with the, with outside the, it, with playing around in this <laughs> conventional reality, you are disenchanted because you, uh, you come to a place where you understand enough of this ultimate reality and the peace that is involved in it when you live in it with full understanding that you, you're not interested in that. And Bonte tells the story of going to a party in, in California when he was just starting to learn meditation and he was studying with Usulananda. He was caught in a situation where everybody was, you know, drinking and being car carousing, not carousing, but you know, they were very loud and everything. And then uh, he said, it's a funny thing about this because they all moved into the other room <laughs> except for two people and the three of them sat down on a couch and had a lovely conversation but you're not interested in the carousing anymore you know you're not interested in the the vi the heavy vibration because you're practicing this way you're calming down all the time and it changes you you get very level but it's not disturbing you know because you because you want this is the part about inviting deeper inspection Okay, you heard the thing in the beginning about this is easy to understand, immediately effective here and now, inviting deeper inspection and um, is going to be untouched by time. Saying that this is the part about is going to um, inviting deeper inspection and you want to know where this will go it's like you went out in a big field in your mom's mansion that she had a great big estate and you found the rabbit hole that the dogs were always chasing into and you decided look at that hole look how deep it is i really want to know where does it go it's like that you really want the answer and it's something that just happens inside us it's hard i said to him once you know, I um, left. So, then, so that's uh, yeah. That, that's the disenchantment, and then what is uh, this passion? This passion is a real turning off. It's a real turning off of total. It's like a total, almost complete turning off of reactions. Okay, and for the person who is angry, reaching to disenchantment, you're just not. You're disenchanted with getting angry anymore. When you're training, you're working, coaching somebody with anger management. They, they, and they, at first they, they learn the link and they begin to realize how, wow, I'm personally involved with this. And they start letting go. And as they let go, they discover life is so much easier, so much beautiful, more beautiful, so, so calm and so real in the present time. I see a sunset and I'm not gonna compare it to anything. I'm just there with the sunset. I remember standing on the bridge and um, not having anything come up at all except the sunset and seeing just this sunset, just for what it was with everything that was happening across the water. We were on a, I was on a bridge with another monk. We were coming back from somewhere to Aurangabad and we stopped and got out of the cab to see this and we're standing there on the bridge and it was just like you were right there. There was nothing there coming, and there was nothing there that was past. Everything was just right there and totally, are you ready for this? <laughs> totally grokking. So now to understand G-R-O-K, <laughs> you have to go read um, Heinlein's book on Stranger in a Strange Land. And you have to read that book to find out what that term is. It's a science fiction book from the 60s and it's very short and it's very famous. He won all kinds of awards with it when he wrote it. And um, this term grok is understanding whatever is happening or whatever you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or touching by becoming it. Like the Irish person that says the trees can talk. How do we know the trees can talk? Because we become the tree. We sit there and feel the heartbeat of the tree and the flow of life in the tree. And eventually if we're there long enough, we hear the tree talk very slowly, but <laughs> Yeah, very slowly, but we hear the tree talk, you see? So 
by by uh, in the sixties, it was kind of fun when this novel happened because everybody would say, "I'm going out with you. I want to grok you." It didn't have anything to do with uh, relations. It's I want to see you, really see you, and nothing else. That's what it was about, you know. You know the movie Avatar. Did you see Avatar? Do you remember that? I see you in the movie. That was from grokking. The case, source of that was grokking. The the producer that did that was our age, <laughs> and he came out of I grok you. <laughs> see, and what you're doing is in in dispassion, you grok something, but the emotion doesn't consume you. So something can be very very pleasurable without being exhausting at all. See can be extremely relaxing and wonderful. People misunderstand dispassion and it gets distressing. And for them, where should we go with this? But like I tried to explain to you in this talk, uh, the Brahma Viharas have a declared destination, you see? And that's the Brahma, the Brahma Lokas. And to end up passing away from this life and being born into the Brahma Lokas as another being sets you up to become an Arahat. You're not going to be born back here. So you get as far as Anagami, you're not coming back here. You see? Again and again and again and again and again. That's that's done. Okay? But you haven't finished with Arahatship uh, completely. And, you know, so when you go to you're in Brahma Lokas, that's when you finish as an Arahat and Arahat or Arahat in fruition there. See? That's how they talk about it. And um, yeah, yeah. But the place people get in trouble is, well, what do I do with my relationship with my wife if this is this way? Well, you need to, you've heard, you've heard Bhante, go and listen to 44. Listen to what Bhante explains was happening between Dhamma and Wisaka. And you get the clarity of what was happening. They're both very well developed. She's a nun and she's an arahat. He's a, he is a um, also either an arahat or an anagami, I can't remember. And he's coming to her with questions because she's got a better, clearer way of explaining than he did. So he's coming to her, yes, <laughs> coming to the woman to get the answers. And she's giving, giving the answers to him. But Bhante tells the story of what happened when he came to get the answers from her. Uh, you know, when this all started between them, he wanted to be uh, a, uh, normally when they were married, they would kiss each other, hug each other and go to bed and have relationship. Now it was like uh, when he became a monk and finally came back home, he didn't want to lie in bed with her. So he got on the floor. So she got on the floor with him. So he got in the bed. <laughs> Finally, she says, wait a second, wait a second, you got to explain what's what's going on here. And then he explained to her what was happening. And he said, I want to go be a monk. And I'll be happy to leave you the house and everything in it. I bet you are you don't want to take care of it. <laughs> so he left her the house and everything in it. But she said, uh, that's okay. Thank you. But is it okay if I go be a nun? Touche. <laughs> Touche. So she went to become a nun, and the story goes she became an Arahat first, and then he became an Arahat afterwards. Is what I think he, they were both Arahats in the end. I think I'm not again exactly remember if he was too, but that's what was happening. And and um, the 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 thing is, there are not mm -hmm. a lot of Arahats in the world, and we w that's a whole story unto itself. I don't want to go into it, but after 150 years after the Buddha. It just isn't happening. And the reason it's not in general happening is because you cannot compete to get there. You cannot try to get there. It's either going to happen or it isn't in this lifetime. And there's too much competition trying to get to the top of the, of the mountain, trying to be the best one and say, I did it and everything else that keeps people away from it. That's all keeping you away from it because this is not one of those type of things where you can be the, the head of the class and be the best one that gets there first. It won't work. 
because you can't be there at all when you're going to fall into cessation. You have to be, have left the building. You're gone. The I is gone and you're just present. This being, what is there is just present when cessation occurs. That's the trick to the whole thing. And everybody thinks, you know, what happened, I believe what happened to this, we've never done this class, everybody's saying, please do it, please do it, you know, is where the slippage is in this. And the slippage concerning this part of the Buddhist teaching is very, very serious because they decided we don't want people to quit, we don't want them to leave if they never get there, so we'll make up stories. We'll change the definition of Nibbana, and I did some research and came up with seven or eight different versions of what people say Nibbana is now. That's a big problem. You're not going by the text anymore. You're just making it up as you go along. Then you have these countries. You've heard Bhante talk about it. Burma says 15 years to get to the first jhana. Somebody else says 10 years. Somebody says five years. The shocking thing to me in this whole thing is how many people are here who came from the university, for instance, tonight, and they asked for the talk. And what talk did they ask for for those six days when we did the workshop? They wanted to know, give us something we can use in our daily life. Make it something that is in relationship to this world here and now. Make Give us what was valuable that doesn't change across time that we can use to better our lives in this century. That's what we're trying to do for you. We're trying to show you this, you see? But you don't have to go as far as being an arahat to have amazing things change in your life. That's the big one, see? And you don't have to be doing it only on a pillow. The other story is that Getting farther is only for the monks. I hate that one because it tells you straight out there were no secrets, nothing was held back for anyone and it was given to everyone. And what we're trying to do <laughs> is give it back to the, where, the owners. You own it. You own this. Humanity owns this. This is not something that was for any one group, race, class, level of people. This was for you, human beings to understand how the human being works with suffering and ha what happens with that, you see? So it wasn't fair to do that. Now that isn't happening in every tradition, but it is, you're gonna run into it, you see? Where somebody will tell you, oh, no, 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 that part is only for the monks. What they're really talking about is that if I told you you don't have to be a doctor anymore, COVID is finished and you can just go up on the mountain, get in the cave and no, We'll leave you there until you go as far as you want to go. Then you wouldn't have anything to worry about. That's what they're really talking about. The monks can do that as long as they continue to have uh, survival for requisites from the people given to them. They can manage to do that. Very few do that. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Very few. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else question? Kuno? Yeah, Kuno? You have a question? Hello, Kuno? Now, you know, um, I was gonna, can I, can I share, uh, Ulysses, can I share what you wrote? You know, that was really good. Yeah, we were, we were, um, we had something come up this week that was real interesting on, um, was it Twim Asia, right? Twim Asia. Yeah. And, and there was a discussion that came up and, um, yeah, okay. Whoops, no. We're, um, Dem, I'm sorry, Ulysses, where was it? On which one? Twim H? Twim? It was in response to the article to... Um, but what, which, one, which one WhatsApp was it? Tw Twim Asia? No, I think I sent it to you on your own. On, on your oh, you, oh, you did. Okay. Wait a minute. Okay. Um, well, see what... Uh, basically... Um, I 
you want to say any? You want to say something in in Hindi or Marathi? Kuno, because Banti Dhamma Dev is here. Hello, hello, Dhamma Gavesi, are you there? Hello, Kunal. Uh, maybe uh, his mic is on uh, by error. Oh, is that what's happening? Okay. Uh -huh. He muted it himself. Oh, oh. Ulysses, tell me what it was. I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. On your WhatsApp, you look at your WhatsApp. I'm trying to, okay, get to my WhatsApp and see where I am. It was to me, he says it was to me. Yes, so you so, do look at Ulysses' messages. Oh, look at Ulysses' section. Okay, okay, I can do that, right. Ulysses, okay. The, um, you know, what this was, was, it was interesting. And it's, it's interesting to note this, what happened, because, you know, there was a, a, a statement that was written by um, someone, they wrote down part of a conversation and they talked about um, uh, what happens when you practice uh, the Brahma Viharas. And I took it basically to mean that the, um, the idea was a lot of people put down practicing metta because they think it will not help them reach Nibbana. And this is very, very mistaken, very mistaken, okay? And um, it is mistaken because, because one thing is metta, the thing is in our center, some people say, some people like to say metta takes you all the way to Nibbana. Okay, it is true, but it's not correct. <laughs> And why I'm saying it that way is metta culminates at the fourth jhana and karuna culminates in infinite space and mudita culminates in infinite consciousness and um, the equanimity culminates in the, um, the level of base of nothingness. Now, the base of nothingness is the seventh level before the uh, neither perception or not perception, and then you fall into cessation, okay? So the point is, it doesn't take you all the way to Nibbana, but neither does breathing. Because if you're looking at breathing in training for breathing meditation, the breathing meditation you keep reducing the breath from this big in the beginning, down, 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 till it's only a hair's width. And then you're at nothingness and you make mind starts watching mind. That's it. Your mind starts watching mind and that's all that's left. You're completely um, reduced out of any hindrances or any personal concerns or anything. You're right there, very, very deep. You're sitting then for anywhere from two hours to four hours. Some people sit for six hours like that. Very, 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 very quiet, very healing for the body because there's no pressure on any of the organs, any of the circulatory system, the brain, no stress, nothing, absolutely none. It's a very, very healing. When we teach a person how to do a uh, power sitting. How can I get two hours of rest in about 10 or 15 minutes? We teach them how to empty out absolutely everything that's happened in the morning and anything in front of them and get into this place that is this present time, sit in your office, close the door, turn off your phone, turn off your any connection for 10 minutes. And if you can drop in for 10 minutes, they tell us that's about the value of about two hours of sleep, 10 to 15 minutes max. Okay. 
this is something I wish all the nurses could understand that they could do at the hospital right now and all the staff at the hospital, because I know what it was like. I used to staff a hospital and I know how exhausted people get. But if you go in a closet, even if it's a utility room and sit on a bucket and just stay there for 10 minutes and you just drop and you just watch inside. And if you want, you send the loving kindness over yourself and you just drench yourself in a waterfall of loving kindness. And then if you near the end, you want to let it shine out you shine, let it shine out and you keep smiling quietly, no noise, 10 minutes. And then you come out, you wash your face and you're just ready to go again. You have much more energy. Anyway, this what was said was basically uh, interesting because it was a scholar trick where you take a, an article and you tell me this much of it and it's that long and you come with your summary here instead of reading to the end of the article. And so what I did was I wrote back and I wrote what he wrote uh, that they said about the Brahma Viharas and I took it to the end of the article and the end of the article was really, really, um, really good. Okay, really, really good. And um, yeah, and they, um, talked about the the uh, value of the Brahma Loka and basically made you understand that in this lifetime, there's no reason to put pressure on yourself to become an Arahat if you can go as far as Anagami. You're not coming back to this world and you go to could go and end up with a Brahma Loka, you're going to finish there. That's fine. So why put the pressure on yourself in this world to go all the way through when you're in a marriage and you've chosen a lay life with a relationship? So this is one way when I once I read this, I saw a way to speak differently to this to a couple. And, and the trouble with this practice is it's fine if both of the couples are both practicing and are relatively at the same level, but it has caused problems over the years with people. It has caused some difficulties it, because if one person is pursuing this really hard and the other person is not, then there's an imbalance there. And you have in lay life, you're trying to get a balance. You are trying to establish a balance and a calm and a basis for this uh, relationship to go for 75 years, <laughs> you see? And you get it for a 75 years relationship. I've met people with 75 and 80 years together. How did they do that? And when you ask them, they maintain a sense of humor to no matter what happens in the world. They understand a Nietzsche and they have this equanimity between them and they have fun. They have fun no matter what happens. And some of the people I've talked to are amazing. They've been through mudslides, lost their houses, been through earthquakes and everything else. How do they keep going? It's their perspective. And the, the understanding, farm people especially have a clear understanding, that's past, this is not here, we're right here. We have to plant, we have to cultivate, we have to harvest, and that's it, bear the crop, to sell the crop, and do it. Yeah, Ulysses. I, I think that's beautiful that you're um, connecting farm practice with, you know, as opposed to city practice, I think they're like, first world problems and third world problems. <laughs> and, and it seems to me like it is in the first world where we're also experiencing um, a lot of non-forgiveness, a lot of like holding on to grudges. Um, it is more difficult for people in the cities to see what reality is because they live um, in a very I, 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 I world rather than uh, we world. And so, um, I was actually I was going to ask you to comment on because there was so much on your earlier exposition about about Atta and Anatta and and how does a person who who is stuck you know gets un, uh, you know uh, out of the out of the mud 
to, to be able to experience loving kindness again, because a lot of people cannot generate that for themselves. When a person, when a, this is the this is the real purpose of the forgiveness meditation. The purpose of it is a a cleansing med meditation to cleanse the person, because in order to comfortably work with the path, they have to be able to let these things fall out. You know, these hurts they have to fall out, and this is the sad part about one of the reasons we're in the situation we are in. Uh, progressive wise across the board with um, with it, it with uh, we're, we're, in, we're stuck we can't seem to go very far with the development is because we didn't take the precepts seriously for a long time and I just did some checking with some people last week I did some checking about does it say anywhere in the text that precepts are training precepts and guess what it doesn't it doesn't. And so that's a modern invention that we've told people, these are training precepts. And as soon as we put that in their head, this is a training precept. And I can do this this week. But when I come to the retreat, I have to do the training precepts. The moment you do that, then everything from the time you let go of them until you come back is inside you, is stuck in here. Perel handles people that have a lot of stuff stuck in here. That's what it is before you have a breakdown, something gets full back here. The headaches are absolutely unbearable. They're strapped and right around your head. And I've talked to lots of people in mental health when I was working as an advocate, the suffering is unbearable. Why? It's because they won't cry, because they won't let it out, because they won't, they don't have to diagnose, they don't have to examine it. They don't have to go into all of that stuff, but just letting it go and understanding that's from back here. That's in the sack. I have it in my sack. So now I think it's time, maybe I could take it off and maybe I could hang it up for just the morning when I go to work, I'll pick it up when I come home. That's a good way to start. Eventually you won't want to pick up that backpack anymore and put it on your back. That's it, you see? But the, the, um, this whole thing about the, uh, taking things personally and impersonally is the best way to solve the situation of Atta and shifting to Anatta perspective. It's the best way. And understanding it's perfectly all right for you to take your time to do this. But you got to understand something happens, it's in here. And the only way it's going to come out is if you just let go and see it for what it is and you can't change it. And then you move on. You learn from it. You don't throw away the lessons. You want to put them on three by five cards or five by seven cards and put them in a shoe box. You go ahead and put those lessons in there. That's fine. You see, but you don't have to go back. I had a problem once with 12 step because at the fifth step, they wanted me to go back to everybody I'd been mean, you know, had trouble with and forgive everybody. <laughs> say, I'm sorry to everybody. And I'm there, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I made a decision here. I'm going to go forward, <laughs> forward. I couldn't do that. So I had to look at the reality of let it go and try and see what it's like right here for a few days and identify if this one belongs in the past, it's in a blue trash can. And if this one's in the future, okay, put it in a pink trash can if you want. And if there's anything that's real important you think you have to look at, put it in a silver trash can, it's gonna come back up, <laughs> it'll come back. And you, you remember those things will come back. Once you get the, the rubbish out of here where they belong, then there's plenty of space for this brain to work. Yep, plenty of space. Okay, anybody else? Okay, we should say our prayer. <laughs> I know you rang two bells. You tried really hard, but everybody was there. So we asked her all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> we're really trying. I just said we're and okay. 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 Suffering the when suffering, suffering free, free and, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all be find relief. 
May all, May all beings share this, this merit that we have that thus, we have thus acquired, acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabit in space and, and earth, devas and nagas of ninety power, share this, this merit, merit of, of ours. May, May they all protect Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.